We are delighted to have partnered with NordVPN again for this season. We partnered with them last year and they are, of course, a supporter of Rangers FC as an official sponsor there. And best of all, we can give you an exclusive NordVPN deal. If you go to nordvpn.com forward slash heart and hand, you will get a huge discount off your NordVPN plan and one additional month for free, completely risk free. There's a 30 day money back guarantee with Nord. And look, I use this product. I would highly recommend it. I used to work in web, so I know how easy it is to steal people's data, especially if you're using a, a, a Wi-Fi system that, that is a shared one or you're using uh, 4 or 5G, then your details can be out there. With NordVPN, they're absolutely not. And there are other advantages to it as well. Um, you can watch sporting events that maybe aren't being shown in your region. Um, you can purchase flights from different virtual locations, and they do make your flights cheaper. This is very, very useful. What a price is in the UK isn't the same as what a price is in America or a price is on the continent. Um, NordVPN can save you money. Um, you can buy purchasing subscriptions from other countries at a cheaper price uh, and you protect your data while traveling and using public Wi-Fi. I keep coming back to that. Anyone who's at the hassle of a cancelled card will know what I'm talking about. So all you need to do is go to nordvpn.com forward slash heart and hand and you'll get a huge discount off your plan and one month additional free completely risk free. I urge you to do it. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Heart and Hand, the Rangers. Yes, my name is David Edgar. I'm your host, as always, and joining me this week on a month here, I have to say, Heart and Hand flagship show. It's the host of Heart and Hand Extra, Adam Thornton. Hello, Adam. A much more pleasant way to spend an hour or so talking about Rangers when they play like that at the weekend. Absolutely, yeah. We've I've, I've done my time on the, the Thursday shows after Europe, but it has not been good. So I'm going to take the take the wins where we get them. There is method to my madness, incidentally, folks, in inviting Adam on today. It wasn't just a random one. Rangers did play significantly better at the weekend. But even to us laymen, who aren't as, as tactically aware as Adam, the author, of course, of uh, Beale's Bloop, sorry, um, Gerard's <laughs> Blueprint, uh, the, the story of Rangers' triumph for 55. Um, but, you know, we talk a lot, uh, jokingly, I suppose, Adam, about the eye test. And even without maybe being, you know, the most tactically aware guy in the world, I could tell, looking at that, that there were things that were being done differently. It can't all just be that they tried a bit harder, can it? It can't just all be that they, they were more determined, more intense, although I think all of these things are factors. But what what was different in the structure and the setup? So this is this is the interesting part, yeah. We don't give the opposition much credit when, when they come. Like Livingston last week, we said, oh yeah, fair enough, well done, sarcastically. You came and you, you got your goal and you sat behind the ball. But we don't give credit. We we, we see Rangers were terrible and, and Rangers were not great on, on that day. Um, But Livingston were very good. On the flip side of that, Aberdeen were absolutely woeful on Saturday. Now, that's not to take away anything that Rangers done, same as it wouldn't take away anything that Livingston managed last week. But coming to Ibrook's, He'd obviously made some comments pre-game, Jim Goodwin, about Rangers being in a bad moment, coming to have a go or whatever. But to me, coming with three defenders, of which two are maybe not natural in those positions, going man for man against, in particular, Kent and Sakala on the wings, with two men up front, and the way that they pressed was courageous, I guess you could call it, um, but also played right into our hands um, in terms of the game plan that we enacted. So that's that's one part of it. I don't think it's a major part. I think, to go back to your other your original point, I think a large part of it is that intensity and tempo and aggression. Um, and I think, for me, the big change in that certainly was seeing someone like John Lundstrom playing a little bit further forward. Um, I think we've went through a bit of an evolution with Lundstrom uh, in that we thought we were getting this type of player, possibly, um, when he joins, someone that can link up on that right-hand side, finally give us someone on that right-hand side of central midfield that we've been crying out for a, a long-term solution for, for for a long time. Um, that didn't quite work out, um, and we put him back into number six, and he's sort of stayed there a little bit. He's had a partner in Ryan Jack, 
sometimes. Sometimes he's moved into a back three once or twice to not great effect. He's moved into a back four uh, as a centre back. So he has been been around a little bit. Um, but I think he set the whole tempo of, of the game. He set the aggression. He set the intensity, and I think that really helps. Um, I would say the major factor in this um, on Saturday, David, although we got a lot of goals, etc., was John San, uh, John Lundstrom and James Sands. I thought the way they went about things in midfield, we always talk about what do we really have to play to hold midfielders uh, home to anybody, really, except Celtic. The answer is usually no, but as we said, Lundstrom got so much further forward. Sands was, played a really, really mature performance in midfield. I haven't been one that thought he, he needed to go into midfield or that he would suit it, but the way that he played that game on, on Saturday, the way that he sort of took the ball forward, initiated the press and was able to pass through, I thought was excellent. So for me, I think we can talk about the chances, we can talk about the excellent play that we had with Sands and Lundstrom there. I think that was a real pivotal part of it for me. Yeah, one thing then about what you said... Would that lead to a slight concern that, you know, with the two performances, Livingston set up one way, Aberdeen set up another, is that concerning then that we are so easily put off our stride by a team who do just sit deep? Yeah, I, I would I would say without, again, it was a great performance and things, but I'm not sure we learned too much. Um, and, and I don't mean that in a, in a bad way. I mean, for as long as I can remember when a team's, came out as Ibrooks who aren't on the same quality level as us. We've ripped them apart. You look at, at previous years when Aberdeen have came uh, and they've tried to go man for man uh, against us and we, was there, there was a 5-0, wasn't there the Greg Stewart game that Stuart McCall yeah. always goes on about? Um, we absolutely destroyed them. So we probably haven't learned anything there. However, I think you're right in terms of Livingston. We probably haven't solved that puzzle and we're going to have to figure that out. Um, but I think if you look at Hearts away, even St Mirren at home, again, St Mirren came and played more similar more similarly to Aberdeen than, than Livingston. So those type of performances I think give us some good groundings, if you like, to go in and, and see that we're actually starting to get somewhere and able to put the goals in when we have that ascendancy in, in games. But in terms of low block, um no, I don't necessarily think that was anything that, that maybe saved us um on Saturday. It wasn't really required to break that down. Um we were able to do it at ease, I think, due to Aberdeen structure and due to what we mentioned there, we've seen obviously the first goal, the excellent pass for Lundstrom. However, there's a mistake in the build up. There's a mistake there from Aberdeen where their left back isn't sure what to do. He ends up going out the way. Tillman gets space, acres of space. Um, then the centre half isn't sure whether he stays with Cholak, Cholak or he has to go with, with Tillman. He goes and ends up nowhere uh, and the ball is rolled to Cholak for um, a straight goal. That's not a breakaway goal or anything. That's quite poor structure on Aberdeen's side, but we've got the players like Lundstrom in there who was able to see that pass and execute it, which um, maybe someone like, uh, I don't know, a Glenn Kamara or, or a Ryan Jack in that position wouldn't um, back themselves to make that pass. So there's always two sides of it. Conversely, I suppose, it's unlikely that any team in the, the SPFL can come to Ibrox and be perfect defensively for 90 minutes, even with a low block. Yes, it's going to force us to uh, have to work a wee bit harder in terms of our creativity, but it's about seizing on those errors, isn't it? You know, with all due respect to the sides in the Premier League that they're not top quality technically. That's just a fact. It's just, you know, that there's no getting away from that. But it is about seizing your moments and that's where the intensity side of it comes in. And look, he was only on the park for eight minutes, but I want to give a wee shout out here to Red Van Yelmaz because I thought it was him who set the tempo because yep. uh, he got the ball quite a lot in those early stages. And each time he drove forward, and not up a cul-de-sac or not, uh, you know, just, just to arrive at the halfway line and, and turn back. And instead, what he did was he, he cut inside, I think, three times and drove past the Aberdeen midfield, which freed up space for Kent, which gave Aberdeen something to think about that they maybe hadn't considered. And I think that even when he went off, Barisic came on and kept playing that way and kept trying to get forward rather than perhaps this safety first, it's early, timidity that allows a team to settle in at Ibrox? Well, I think that's <clears throat> that's what we want to see and I think that's been one of the things that I've been concerned about uh, is that we seem to play a completely different way sometimes when a completely different player um, is playing. I guess as you would expect, however, I think the coaching staff, if it is the way they want to play it is, as we said, with Gilmaz cutting inside, Kent being on the outside. We've seen exactly the same on, on the opposite side. Anytime Tavernier plays with Sakala, Tavernier sits on the inside and does underlaps and, and Sakala will stay wide. That, to me, is perfect for breaking down 
um, defensive units. We just haven't seen enough of it. But it was really, really pleasing. I thought, David, that when Barisic came on, as you said, he did the same thing. Um, obviously, slightly different. He's, he's a different type of player. But it wasn't just, let's get the ball wide and smash it in um, the way that Barisic normally does and does work very, very well. He did do that in the second half where we got the third goal, but there was a bit more variance in it. So that, to me, is the coaching staff saying, OK, this is how we want our fullbacks to play when this winger is also playing with them or under whichever set of circumstances. But it's not just going to be a case of let's just hammer the ball wide and, and get it in. We did resort to that last week, and I think John Lundstrom said post-match that was really disappointing for him and for the, for the players that they not necessarily panicked, but they knew the performance wasn't good enough and they sort of resorted to almost like a safety mechanism of let's just get the ball to, to have Barisic, Kent and, and see if they can do something from the wide areas, which when you talk about mistakes, um, the size of the Livingston centre-halves, that's meat and drink to them. They're not going to make many mistakes there. No, um, what, you need to get them coming and, and you do. working, yeah. And I think that's where, OK, you can say there was lots of space against Aberdeen, but we never even really tried against Livingston. We, we, we never played those passes in to feet just to see what would happen. You never know. Like you said, if that ball goes into Tillman, maybe he's got his back to goal against Livingston. He comes out a little bit. It might leave a chink of space for Sakala to come in on the on the blind side and try and get in the way that he did for his chance in the first half. There's all these types of things that I think come down to our approach. Um, it will be more difficult against someone who comes and plays like Livingston did, but it doesn't mean that we shouldn't try it. And I also have to say that I think that Barisic, we got quality crosses rather than quantity yeah, at, the week, uh, at the weekend. I mean, the goal for Tavernier, oh, it was 21, 20, uh, 2021 yeah. vintage, that one. Um, that's a superb ball into the box. That's begging for someone to get on the end of it rather than just, I'll put this in the box and see what happens. And he was measuring his crosses and he was interacting with Kent. And I think confidence did spread throughout the side as they began to realise that they were on it and their teammates were on it and they began to try different things. Now, there's a few players I want to, to speak about because of their individual contribution to the match, but also what it might tell us about the future. The first one is James Sands, who you mentioned there. Uh, seemingly, if he was going to play, really up until now, it, it seems to have been, well, he's going to play as a centre-back. And, you know, sometimes that's been through injury, and it might well be again. But he was given his chance in the centre midfield. And as you say, I, I just like the balance a lot more because the thing with, with Sands is he's just a little quicker in his passing. He's not expansive in the way that, you know, he's not going to sit in quarterback and spread the ball about wing to wing. But when he gets the ball, he returns it very quickly in a way that perhaps our other midfielders who've been playing that position don't. I think you've spot on. Um, you look at maybe, and Lundstrom does this as well, so it's not it's not anyone, but you look at maybe when, when Lundstrom receives the ball as a as the deepest line midfielder and he always receives it with a sort of closed body shape, which basically just means the ball comes straight to him and he's just going to pass it back to, to, to Davies or whatever. On the rare occasion that someone's not pressing him, then he can absolutely turn and, and spray those passes. But with Sands, you never really get that. Um, I've completely changed my opinion, uh, I think, on, on Sands since the start of the season, which I know people don't really like to do, but you should try it. It's, it's, quite, it's quite good. It's fun. Um, it is fun. So I, I thought at the start of the season, PSV, etc., fantastic. He's going to play as a centre-back. Um. I still think left. I still think a, a centre back and a three might suit him a lot better than than in a, a two. But on Saturday, I thought as a sort of defensive midfielder, I thought it was fantastic. He is moving the ball a lot quicker than I thought when he played midfield at the tail end of of last season, um, which is great to see. He he has this ability, I think, to to attract opposition players to him as well which then makes the simple pass that he makes much more effective because they're able to, to move. He is good on the ball, doesn't have maybe the physicality that we would just need as a, in a centre-half, which is absolutely fine. Um, and I don't just mean that in height. I think you look at how physical Leon King can be and how physical he was um, for that chance before half-time. Um, I'm not sure Sands is really that guy. Um, he's much more of a sort of ball-playing defender, if you like. So um, it's great to have the option. You, you look at Sands and Lundstrom and they can both play midfield, centre-back in a four or centre-back in a, in a three if we really have to. And we're in a pinch just now with, with centre-back. So having that is is great. But I, I think if we see more of that from Sands at the weekend, then I think he's got a, a wee opportunity here when we are low on reliable um, central midfielders. He's maybe got a bit of an opportunity to to get his stake his claim in there next to Lundstrom because I thought he was, he was really, really impressive. As was Malik Tillman 
um, who's t- back in favour after a few weeks dropping out, after his form did dip from what we saw early in the season from him. Now, Adam, I think if we've learned one thing in his short time here, it's that he's not a right winger and he should no. not be getting played out there. You need him where he was at the weekend, which is just behind the striker, just in front of the midfield. And I thought he had an excellent match. He's blessed and cursed with that style that Rangers fans sometimes uh, can have an issue with, especially when things aren't going well. That He is languid. He's not Daniel Candace. He's not going to be running constantly. Um, that's not his game. His game is to get on the ball and make things happen in areas where there aren't uh, there isn't much space, um, which we need. And he did that at the weekend. And interestingly, after the match, John Lundstrom was asked about him and said, look, we've got to stick with him. Um, he's an excellent player. He's one of the best young talents I've ever seen. He said he's the best young talent he's ever seen. And he's a great player. And we all just need to, the fans and players, stick with him and, and help him come through this. And I was thinking about that because I think it's the loan thing. I think that fans, when a youngster comes into the team, you know, one of our own youngsters, do give them a wee bit more time. Um, sometimes, you know, you get the the instant after match reaction. Leon King got it after Napoli, of course. But I think generally speaking, within the stadium, people are aware that youngsters do make mistakes and need to to be given a bit of time to settle. I think the issue comes that when it's a player who's on loan, fans are very much you need to do it now. That's why you're here. You've been brought in to do it here. And it's not always possible, especially with a teenager, rightly or wrongly. Whereas I think if perhaps he has a permanent signing, you go, well, we need to make this work. And you give him that wee bit more leeway. There is clearly a player in there who can do some extraordinary things. He's not going to do it for 90 minutes. That's not his style. It's not who he is. But in a side that lacks different ma- difference makers at times, he is one. I'm quite bad for this. I'm not sure if anybody listening will be the same, but anytime someone mentions Tillman, £6 million just comes into my head all, all the time. Um, same with Sands, £4 million quid kind of comes into my head when we think if that's the, the rumoured fee for him. So maybe there's a bit of bias there from people and that they judge that player based on should we, and not necessarily should anyone be spending £6 million, but should Rangers be spending £6 million on him? So maybe that's where some of the, the judgment comes from. But you're absolutely right. For someone who is in his first season of senior football anywhere and is only 20 I think expectations um, from the fans have been harsh maybe it is that that fee um, it's absolutely no shame to be um, to be taken out of the team um, as a young player I think we, we see that with young players all around the world if you're fatigued because you're not used to senior men's football um, and your performances are, are maybe dipping a little bit or your fitness is dipping a little bit then by all means come and have a breather on the bench for whatever it was four or five games and come back in. Um, I think you're right. I think he is quality. Um, I'll maybe go on my tactical high horse a little bit and say, technically, we haven't actually seen him on right wing any more than about two times. He sort of played on that right side of a, a three and inverted a little yeah, bit. Yeah, but I think that. Anfield is bummed into our side. Yes, I think Anfield was, was the one where everyone said he's absolutely not that. Um, but we always talk about those three tens, if you like, that we had behind Morelos. And I think occupying that right... One for him, I do think he he still has ability in there, but what he would need is his legs coming up um from midfield or 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 on the, the flanks for him. But yeah, I completely agree. I think moments in the games, he he's the guy I think we're trying to replace Joribo with. I think in terms of that, maybe even that language style uh, as well that he's got, but just in terms of that magic that we can get from from the number ten position. Um, I think him and Haji be interesting to see. I, I can't see many starting lineups for both of them. No, uh, play t- play together, um, yeah. but it'd be quite interesting to see how we how we manage that. But I think he's coming into form at the right time. I thought he was fantastic that that moment. He's very cool in front of goal, which I'm not sure you could say about um about Aribo. Um, he seems to be able to pick that moment when he gets into that chance. For me, I think it's more about Tillman's personality, maybe his belief, maybe just trying to get himself up to speed with everyone else. Um, but what I've seen from him. In sort of decisive moments, you think PSV away, obviously the Motherwell goal, and then again uh, at the weekend he scored against what was the, he scored the winner against USG as well, didn't he? So, yeah. um, those moments I think he's showing a player who can absolutely finish and can contribute in the key moments in the attacking third. If he's a little bit slack in terms of tracking back and build up play, and some things don't come off, I'm sort of less critical on that when you've got someone who can provide those moments, particularly when, as you say, he's, he's only twenty years old. 
And the other places I wanted to, to focus on were the wide areas where Fashion Sakala and Ryan Kent played. Firstly on Sakala, I thought he was excellent. Uh, I really did. After a slow start, missed a chance, composure, which unfortunately you can't really teach. You either have or you, you don't in front of goal. Like when the, the pass was played into Cholak, you went, that's a goal because you yep. knew, right? That's just that's a fact. That's what he does. It would be a bigger shock had he missed. With Sakala, you're always 50 50. Um, heavy touch, and then the, the, the chance sort of gets away from him, um, or he allows at least the goalkeeper the room to make the save. Um, but he stuck at it manfully, and I thought, particularly second half, he absolutely tormented Aberdeen. Um, just was was going past his man for fun, uh, getting in at the box, set up a goal, um, playing the ball across. There were times where you know he hits the first defender, he plays it straight out, he did that once, and or he falls over. But that is kind of who he is, and he's he's in his mid twenties. He's not a kid. It's not going to go away. He's always going to be erratic, but. What I liked about his performance at the weekend was the constancy of it, because that is something we need to do to teams in Scotland, which is you wear them down. If you keep driving at somebody throughout the game, you will get past them uh, a few occasions because we go back to the fact that these are not, with all due respect, top level defenders. They will make errors, but you've got to keep at it. Uh, we didn't against Livingston, as, as we've mentioned. We went back to just right cross, 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 or give it to a man who's you know triple marked. And I think when you have that in the side, then that constancy wears down the opposition. And the fact that Rangers in the last 10 minutes looked as though they could almost score at will, the one offside, and then Morelos got the goal. It's That's not luck. You know, that's the fact that you've ran the other team into the ground. I think with Sakala, we need to be looking at saying, right, he's got the shot, or at least telling him, you've got the shot for five or six matches uh, going you know, go and make it your own. Because I look at the other two options there at the moment. Matondo hasn't done enough to suggest he should get a start. Scott Wright has had many more opportunities and really hasn't taken them. You know, there was a wee burst yep. at the end of last season domestically, but that was it. Sakala's downsides are obvious, but the upside is big as well. And for me, I think he's a guy you've got to accept that there will be times he does drive you nuts. There will be chances missed, but there will be chances and there will be, there will be creation, which is not something I see from his rivals for that shot. No, um, I'm a big Sakala fan. I, I, I think I have been since uh, I was quite excited when he joined, um, but a sort of tempered expectation given what I'd seen um, in Belgium. Um was possibly thinking we might not play in a way that, that suits him. However, I think he's been pretty adaptable, to be honest. Um, there's a debate there, and we get into this whole black and white situation. When you say someone is a good player, you don't mean that they are 100% a first pick for Rangers, and we think they're absolutely fantastic. I think what you mean is, in specific moments, as with Aberdeen um, at the weekend, these players can be absolutely fantastic. I guess there's a wider point there about we should probably have more players that are able to consistently play and we absolutely should have a number one option on that that right hand side. But as a as a rotation option, as someone who can come in and play twenty five starts or whatever and, and the same again as a as a sub coming on, I don't have any issues with Sakala. Um he will be inconsistent. It's trying to find out when it's trying to be able to figure out when we're going to get that consistency from him and get him in the team. As bad as he was against Dundee at a, a lower level, he was excellent um at the weekend. And he just he just makes things happen, which I really like, and he might not be in full control of it. But when you think, and again, it's all about expectations, a free transfer coming in last season in a really difficult season, and he got 12 goals and seven or eight assists from not a huge amount of game time in terms of first picks, first starts. For a free transfer coming in, that's a really decent piece of business for, for a rotation option, particularly in a team who are crying out for more people to score goals from, from other areas. So... Is he 100% a nailed-on starter in the team? No, I'm not sure many people would say that. Can he come and contribute and be a valuable member of the squad? And like you said, will he offer more than maybe a Scott Wright who's around about the same age but hasn't really shown anywhere near the same level of um, output as someone like Sakala had? Yes, I would say he probably can offer more. I thought he was great, and I really like the way that he then opens up the um, the inside for, for Tavernier. The way that he just stays so wide, stretches the play, um, it's just fantastic. Even um, for the goal, staying so the first goal, staying so wide to allow that space for Tillman is great. The only downside I had in his performance is, like you said, th that ball that he got played in for his goal, David, is his game entirely. Coming in at pace, taking that ball, 
bearing down on goal. He really needs to finish that. That's the one yeah, disappointment from the game. But I thought his actions when he got the ball were fantastic. But equally, that relationship with Tavernier and being able to stretch and create those gaps uh, in the Aberdeen defence, I thought were great. Um, I thought he was probably my man of the match. I think I might I might have said Lundstrom on the day, but I think just in terms of well, um, you were what absolutely he offered, hammered. Adam was in hospitality on Saturday, folks. Yes. So yeah, I definitely wasn't too like my man of the match as much as I like him, but I absolutely took the took the picture with him as an opportunity. Yeah, that, uh, we got some abuse actually after the game. We we were the sponsors of the match ball, not the match day. Um, yes. And it's match day who pick the man of the match. It wasn't us, so don't you know? Don't don't hate on us. Although Adam did get to meet the sponsors man of the match, so you know photo with Big Chola. I'm not sure I'd want a photo with Big Chola because no, it, it would make me realise what a troll I am uh, looks wise. Great. And... I got I tried to get the match ball in the picture as well and got my angles all wrong and I think you can yeah you that can was see alcohol, how, wasn't it? how bold I am. Yeah. Dear, yeah well, I mean he is, nobody's looking at you in a photo of you and Chola if that helps. No that's true. Right that's you true. know because he just shines with his golden handsomeness. But uh, yeah the other one was Ryan Kent and really Adam Especially when it, everyone was happy, you know, on Saturday night, because it was a good performance. Um, rarely have I seen a, a, a player's performance split opinion the way that Kent's did. I had people saying, I thought Kent was brilliant today, best I've seen him in a long time. And I had people saying Kent was rotten, um, couldn't get anything going at all. Uh, I'm kind of in the middle. I don't think he was great, and I don't think he was awful. Uh, he got the ball and he ran at Aberdeen a lot. Uh, it didn't come off a lot. He was losing the ball. But I, I did think that... He was involved a bit more. Uh, he was playing in Barisic at the right time rather than just constantly waiting for the overlap and constantly turning inside. Uh, I thought he was better, um, but I, I must admit I fall somewhere in the middle with that one. Is it with, with Ken expectation, the expectation, the fee, who he is, what he's done in the past, that people go, yeah, you were you know 7 out of 10 on Saturday, which I thought he was, but you should be 8 or 9 and therefore... I'm disappointed because we do grade players on a curve. You have expectations for your better players. And that's perfectly fair because footballers don't get paid on the same scale. You know, the better the player you are, the more money you earn. So they get paid on the on that curve as well. I think you're spot on. Um, I think that's absolutely the case. The expectation comes. What I would say is I think there's quite a lot of people um, whose opinions on Kent are very, very, very entrenched and will now never change, um, which is absolutely fair enough. I think if you've got that level of, um, I don't want to say hatred, but if you've got that, that such a sure opinion on, on a player, then unless, like you said, unless it is a 9 or 10 out of 10 for a consistent period of time, you're just not going to change your opinion on it. Um, I know people that haven't rated them from, from the start and will refuse to change their opinion on it. It's just the way that football fans work, I guess. You want to have an opinion and, and nothing, unless it's completely ridiculous will change your mind on it um, I thought it was fine at the weekend um, if I told you that Ryan Kent had the most assists joint most assists in the league with um, James Tavernier and Jota I'm not sure many people would um, realise that or think that um, so he is absolutely offering something um, if it's enough based on the fee if we've now got a bit of angst about letting £7 million pounds or whatever we could have got from at his peak £15 um, million pounds walk out the door and everything is based on that, then that's absolutely their opinion. But yeah, I thought he was thought he was good. Um, I think, as we've said for years on here, the work that he does off the ball uh, is great. On the ball this season has not been great at all. Um, and I think we've we've absolutely said that. But um, there is still delivery in there. We've only played 11 or 12 games and he's got five assists so far. So he is still contributing um, and he hasn't played all of those games. So um, he is still contributing, whether it's at the level of for, for the expectation or whether people just want him to score um, more goals than he does is he absolutely should. fine. I mean, but he I think really should complex. score more goals than he does. Yeah, but we seem yeah. to have we've seemed to have wandered into a very complex relationship that the fans have got with him. Yeah, it was just interesting because as I say it wasn't even a, a day where you know people were at each other's throats, and then coming coming out of it, obviously on the heart and hand site and on social media. It really was a split between it was really good and no, actually it was really bad. And I thought, wow, that's that's such an interesting one that people can watch. The you know we all view a game differently, but to to split along those two lines quite as significantly as they did uh, really surprised me. And I think you're right. I think there is a bit of people have just judged. I think the contract situation as well uh, colours that. But I, I think that with Ken, we can be over reliant on him, so he stands out more when he's not 
delivering that because you know Livingston's a great case in point. Get the ball to Ryan and hope he does something. And when it's funny though because we then use that as we use that as a negative, don't we? And say, well, we're so over reliant in that game, and then we have games where we have other players that are contributing, so we're less reliant, and people will say, okay, oh, never played very well, did he? And you're like, well, okay, it can't be both. So, uh, are we too reliant on him, or are we not? Yeah, we are, but I think that when the fact that Aberdeen realised there was a threat coming down the right, and that doesn't always happen in our games, but yes. when when they realised that and they couldn't quite focus on him the same way, and a threat coming out of the centre as well, you know, because Tillman was galloping on and, and Lundstrom, as you, you mentioned there, was mm-hmm. pushing forward. and It just changes things, even little things at the weekend, like Rangers were shooting from outside the box or looking yeah. to, which meant Aberdeen couldn't sit in the way they did. You know, Livingston were able to do. Livingston knew nobody had to go and press. They knew that a shot was unlikely to come. And you you have to mix it up uh, a little bit more, and and we didn't mix it up at all the previous week. We had one tactic, we stuck with it doggedly, and you know it it, it was sad really to watch Rangers just playing this clusterfuck of a performance. Whereas at the weekend there was verve and there was energy. Confidence, Adam, is one of these strange intangibles in football that you know you nobody can know how to bottle it, but you know it when you see it, and. Strangely enough, conceding the way we did, and by the way, I know that you are the president of James Tavernier fan club, but play to the whistle. I mean, come on, mm, that's yeah, that's that a was... basic. Um, it was a dive, by the way, and should have been pulled up and ruled out. But even so, you don't just stop and turn to the ref when the ball's in no, play. That was, yeah, I didn't um, catch that until the the highlights. But yeah, that was a, that, a shocker. That, why why wasn't that then called for for VAR or anything? Is that not a well, what's the, what's the, the only thing I can think of is that the the VAR didn't think it was a clear and obvious. Yeah, that's the um, word. Whereas to me, it's either a penalty. I mean, I, I'm not a believer, by the way, that any contact uh, uh, or sort of these incidents, you hear people say, well, if he hasn't given a penalty, he has to book him. No, you don't. You can think there was contact, but it's not a penalty. Um, so it's not as binary as that. But that was one that was. It is either a penalty kick or it, in which case you can... You can then say, well, they scored, so that supersedes the penalty. But then you should check to see if it was, in fact, a penalty. If your decision was that it was a penalty um, as part of the goal check, I, I, I didn't get it myself, but you, you still you cannot stop in those circumstances. But No, that was horrendous. Um, I still think that was uh, the best I've seen Tab for a while as well, second half in particular. I mean, the last month, he does not score that goal. No, he doesn't. So I, I was going to ask you about that then, because obviously we've had loads of chat about fitness uh, and this team's running more than his thing is uh, it's a stat that we always talk about stats without context etc that's absolutely fine um but I, i'm not sure it always tells the, the full story i'm not sure we then can extrapolate that to rangers are lazy or rangers aren't, aren't fit i think every game is has a different challenge in it there may be games that we run less than an opposition and beat them 8-0 there may be games that we run more than them and, and only draw one or two i'm not sure it always adds up to more running equals more good wins. Um, but I was going to ask you about that because to the two players that have probably been spoken about in that way in terms of either lacking fitness or, or being injured and still playing were Lundstrom and Tavernier. Um, coming off the back of that on uh, on midweek and coming off the run that they've been on where everyone said they've they've been tired, etc. What do you think happened at, at the weekend then? Because you can't you can't just be, oh, I'm absolutely knackered and then turn up on Saturday and be playing out your skin. Is it? Do you think it was more of a confidence and intensity type thing rather than just sheer fitness? It's a bit, a bit of both, I think. I think, look, I, I cannot be persuaded that Tavernier hasn't been carrying something. I'm sorry, yeah. right? I mean, there, there's been times he's been running down that wing right in front of where we are at Ibrox and you can see him wincing, right? So I think that there's definitely been an issue there. The fact that Rangers have changed his position slightly to have a much more infield with a midfielder wider to, to cover that, I think is suggesting that the Rangers are trying to work around it at the moment. So I can't be persuaded that that isn't the case. But uh, of course, I think confidence in any job, you know, when you're upbeat and happy and going for it and things are going well, then you'll fly into things. You don't feel it as much uh, as they say, you don't, you know, the adrenaline carries you through. But to see him ghosting in at the back post, getting above a defence and, and heading home a Barisic cross was oh, it gladdened my heart because he just hasn't been doing it. Now, partially, I think that's due to fitness, but partially it's due to confidence as well. And it's it's that enthusiasm that comes when confidence arrives. And I also think when any football team is confident, then it it, it plays without thinking so much, if that makes sense. 
you can overthink a game we did against Livingston, right? I better not, you know, doubt creeps in, or I better not try that pass in case it gets cut out, or I better not, you know, and you turn around, and that's when you end up doing just the basic thing all the time because you get overwhelmed and end up not making a decision that you should make, whereas you play naturally. We, we talk about it all the time, Adam. There's a great old phrase for it, which is trying too hard. And yeah. for me, that trying too hard always uh, it, it always translates to overthinking it. And then when you overthink things, you make bad decisions on a football field because it's so instant. A lot of it is playing by instinct. Yeah, it's about learning, you know, positionally where you should be and about, you know, I need to make this run if he does that, all of that. But things that should happen naturally don't happen naturally. And that's when Rangers break down into that fractured, fragmented kind of performance that we saw against Livingston. So I think it's a bit of both. Uh, John Lindstrom spoke afterwards about it and he said... Uh, the, the comments he made on that podcast were a bit misconstrued. What he meant was he'd been playing with pain, but footballers play with pain. That there comes a point in your life where there's just nothing you can do about it. That it unfortunately affects you and all footballers his age will have to play through it. So I do think there was a bit of both involved in it, but as fans, we are clearly, you know, it, it's difficult for us to, to judge that, we can only go on what the players tell us, but I think our eyes, certainly with Tav, have been telling us something different, but it was great to see that goal in particular was just perfect. It was really good to see, and I think that marauding fullback play that we hadn't seen for a while was back, and I think a lot of that is to do with having legs next to him and, and Lundstrom, probably, um, having someone to, to aim for, uh, and Tillman and Cholak, and then obviously having Sakala as well, so I think there's a whole big jigsaw puzzle that, to be honest... I think we said on Extra last week, consistency of selection has been horrendous through injuries, form, poor poor results, etc., whatever you want to call it. There are factors for it, but consistency of selection has been ridiculous. Obviously, we're now without Yilmaz and possibly Ben Davies, which is, is not great. But I think we said on that show, if we could get the same back five plus Sands and Lundstrom in front of them, so the same back seven playing for a few games, which we're not going to get now, but if we could have seen that uh, and try and get a bit of rhythm in there and just rotate the forwards as... Um, as best we can to try and get maximum impact then that would have been great we absolutely seen that at the weekend it's just a shame that we've had those couple of injuries and we won't see that now but I think that probably helps as well for Tavernier when you've got that sort of combination of people around about him and he's not having to bomb up and down that flank on his own when he's got maybe an Arfield inside of him um, who doesn't offer the same legs if you like going back the other way um, I think that can really make a big difference to his performances as well particularly because I think today might be his birthday. He's not getting any, he's absolutely not getting any younger as well. Right. Uh, let's take a quick moment to talk about your bollocks. It's that time of the show where I talk to you about balls and not the round ones that our players are kicked towards the goal, but the two dangly ones that you keep in your trousers. Because if you are interested in having bald testicles, then there's only one place to go, and that's Manscaped.com. Manscaped are the market leaders for all of you disgusting people who like to walk about with no pubic hair. I think this is a modern affectation, but hey... Well, not mine ads. If you want to walk about with uh, a couple of uh, Phil Mitchells in your downstairs, that's quite all right by me. And I'll even help you with 20% off and free shipping if you go to manscaped.com. That's just enter the code RANGERS. That's all you need to do. Go to manscaped.com, enter the code RANGERS, and they will send you out this lovely package of stuff. And it is a lovely package of stuff, by the way, that you get from them. And it is tremendously effective at shaving body hair in general because I've done my shoulders with it. Yes, I have hairy shoulders. I'm from Ayrshire. But uh, you get loads of stuff with it as well. You get ball deodorant, you get spray, you get a t-shirt and you get very comfortable boxer shorts. You can also go for their nose trimmer, which is excellent. And trust me, nobody likes hairy noses. I didn't think people liked hairless balls, but yet here we are. Manscaped.com, 20% off and free shipping. Use the code RANGERS. Now, we go on now to Ajax on Tuesday night. Um, yeah, as you mentioned there, we might be missing a couple of players for it, of course. Kelsey Prees, all of that sort of thing. Uh, it's a game that's pretty much meaningless, Adam. I know that some people have jokingly said, well, if we win 5 now, we're not going to win 5 now. So we're not going to win by five clear goals. Short of them, I've been three men sent off in the first 10. So... I think, though, there is an opportunity to restore a teeny little bit of pride. Um, as, as Giovanni Van Bronckhorst said, it would give us the same points as Ajax, which shows you the kind of quality of the, the other two teams in the group. You know, last year's beating finalists and, of course, I think the form team in Europe, which is all fair enough, but it doesn't, 
erase the fact that it's been horrendous to watch. But it's also two and a half million quid for one night's work, and that's not kind of money we can earn in many places. It's not. Um, I think we just need a bit, a bit of happiness in this, don't we? The, the only happiness we've really had is that first half against Liverpool, and it was completely obliterated within, uh, within the second half. So. There's nothing to lose. Um, there's obviously been nothing to lose for a, for a couple of games, I, I guess. But in front of Ibr- at Ibrox, we've got a couple of games coming up before the break. We know this is realistically our, our last chance in Europe, our last game in Europe for, for this season. Um, I think we need to go out and try and channel some of those Europa League performances that we had last year. I mean, you think about some of those lineups that we played in in that when we had Aribo and, and Wright playing in, in attack um, and it was a bit of a patchwork team. We're, we're going into it in the same kind of way. Um, it is a shame that we won't have the team that maybe started at the weekend to try and give that bit of, of continuity there. That would have been would have been excellent. I I was expecting that we would probably have to move Sands into defence and obviously Barris who's playing left back so there's maybe a slot opening up there for uh, maybe a Kamara or a Davis to come in if Kamara's, if Kamara's fit. Um, but I just hope that we sort of go out there and um, we we sort of we go for it, and we can try and get ourselves some points on the board and a bit of pride with a with a victory would be very very much welcome. I think as far as Europe's been concerned this season. Yeah, I mean it's not going to you know change the 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 campaign that's been, but it, it would be nice to end it on a high. And as I say, the money would be you know, very useful. Yeah. And, and remember, Ajax have had a bit of a torrid time in this Champions League campaign themselves. Um, they've they've been in the end of some fairly savage beatings as well that they weren't expecting. I don't think they expected to ship six at home, for example, any more than we expected to ship seven. So with that in mind, it's going to be, a, a you know, they'll be determined to, to at least get the win and say, right, well, you know, we weren't as good as those two, but we were clearly better than than, than Rangers. But uh, I think that, you know, going down to, to having less games is not going to be a bad thing in terms of the league campaign. And it's a strange one because, you know, in terms of financial health, then... Tuesday night is clearly the most important game at the next two. But in terms of the season and among the fans, St Johnston at the weekend is far, far more important. But while you should be able to kind of put the Champions League in a box and say that's different from domestic, I don't have any doubt, Adam, that the confidence that took a battering in those group stages has bled into the league campaign at times. So if we could get a win, conversely, that might go the other way. It could do. And I think we probably need to bear in mind as well. I think there's a lot of um maybe a lot gets gets overlooked in terms of A, how much exertion I think we've we've had to, to deal with in terms of the Champions League. Um and then with that in, with those injuries having such a smaller squad, the players that are playing are a, another year older than, than they were. There's all these factors that we don't think about. There aren't necessarily excuses, but they're factors I think that we need to think about. Um if you think about how we played on Saturday, um we only had two days really in between um, Napoli and uh, Aberdeen. This time round, we've only got two days in between Aberdeen and Ajax, but we have five days, four or five days in between Ajax and St. Johnston. So if there's a way that we can go out and maybe empty the tank with three or four players that maybe we don't need to play at the weekend um, in terms of a rotation, I think we could do that. And we've got an extra two days two days recovery. Because you're right, in the grand scheme of things, I guess the weekend's game is, is much more important. However, I think we... We need to give a good account of ourselves and hopefully we can get some much needed rest um, in those couple of days after Ajax. Yeah, I think we need it for ourselves, you know, yeah. over and above anything else. I think the players need it. Um, and as I say, it would be, you know, the mood has shifted a bit from the weekend. One swallow doesn't make a summer, but at least a standard has been set now. And fans, I think, are quite right to go, right, OK, you can play like that, so do it. You know, do it against St. Johnson at the weekend. Let's not see this fearful clustery, you know, guys in each other's pockets at the halfway line, nobody really moving up front. That won't be acceptable at the weekend. It won't be acceptable on Tuesday night, but it certainly wouldn't be acceptable at the weekend. And and the players, again, have shown that they have it in them to, to play like that. So I don't think it's outrageous for fans to go, right, well, you know, certainly to the World Cup, go out and do that. Make Livingston an idea and then we can, you know, look forward, get to the break and you get four weeks training, recovery, players coming back, all of that sort of thing, and, and start off the second half of the campaign in, in a good place. 100%. And if there's a... I think I said this on Extra as well, but if there's a positive to come out of, of going out of Europe, it, it means that we have those free midweeks um, when we come back. I think we've got, what, five or six months 
and there's only a couple of midweeks in there. Obviously, some cup games, etc. might come in to, to skew that a little bit, but more often than not, we're going week to week. Um, and I think if you ask coaching staffs from a tactical tra- training point of view, the more training days they can get on the pitch, the better. So we get to this break if we can, um, and then they have, I would imagine, a, a couple of days, a couple of weeks off, maybe one one or two weeks off, and then there's three or four weeks of getting in there and, and doing almost like a little mini tactical pre-season, if you like, because they should have their base level of fitness still there. So getting in there and, and seeing what we can do, having all these players back, I think, I hope we start to see more more Aberdeens than, than Les Livingstons once we go over that, uh, once we go over that World Cup break. That would be nice. More Aberdeens and less Livingstons. I like that. That's Never thought exactly. I would say I want to see more from Aberdeen, but yeah. You I don't want to see more of them. Yeah, I, I'd agree with that. Uh, their fans, of course, disgracing themselves at the weekend. I, I kind of find it hard to get too annoyed at Aberdeen fans now because of the incredibly low opinion I have of them in the first place. Um, you know, to me, they're just, they're basically like children screaming for attention uh, constantly. They are the the sort of shock troops of Scottish football, the shock jock troops of, of Scottish football. And I just find them really boring, um, to be quite honest with you. So, yeah, I mean, scum gone scum, I suppose, is the, the, the phrase that comes to mind. Right then, folks, uh, that will do us on the flagship for this week. Adam will be back later in the week with Hart Hand Extra to look back at Ajax and look ahead to the trip to Perth. Uh, you can hear more from us over on Patreon. Uh, we were able to, of course, sponsor the match the, the match ball at the weekend. And so they kept up our 100% record, Adam. Um, every time we've sponsored the Rangers match in some way, we've won. Uh, so you know more people sign up we'll be able to do it more often Uh, we're coming up for our fifth anniversary on Patreon if you're not there you've been missing out and luckily all the content is there in the archives and quite a treasure trove it is as well as well as all the new contents go to patreon.com forward slash heart and hand right my thanks to our executive producers in London Mike Lee and Paul Myers and of course my thanks to the wonderful Adam Thornton author of the best-selling uh, the Gerard Blueprint, the the inside story of fifty five, and Adam, uh, Christmas is coming and the goose is getting fat. It absolutely is. Yes, thank you for that little segue there. Yes, Christmas is coming. Um, I do still have some signed copies here. If anyone would like to, to um, to purchase some, I'm not going to go through the spiel of what the book is about. I've bored everyone to tears about it. You can go and check my my Twitter and you'll see all of it there. It's available to buy heartandhand.co.uk forward slash Gerard's Blueprint. Yes, it's been a bestseller um, on Amazon. Um, I think it's like, not to downplay myself a little bit, David, but I think it's like that new manager um, category on on betting. Anytime one or two people buy in, in this category, it becomes a bestseller. But I'm not complaining. I've took, the, I've took the pictures, the evidence of it, and it will be ingrained in my mind that I'm a bestseller. So that's good enough for me. But yes, if anyone would like to buy with Christmas coming up, either you can message me on Twitter or you can go to um, Gerard's blueprint on the Heart and Hand website, and you can purchase there. Yeah, I'm gonna. <laughs> I was just thinking there. Uh, I'm gonna get you a badge made of this. Is I'm a bestseller, Ralph Lauren <laughs> style. I, I think that would be nice for Christmas, right, folks? Thank you so much for joining us, and let's hope that we get a performance, an overdue Champions League performance on Tuesday night. Enjoy the match, and we'll talk to you again later in the week. Take care, everyone. Bye bye. <laughs>